Okay, so it's 6.32, and let me just read this uh, notice before we start. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. So with that, let me open the meeting um, of the Human Rights Commission. Um, are there any announcements? So our agenda today is pretty straightforward, public comment, followed by um, several items, Citizens for Juvenile Justice. And of course, the nomination of a co-chair, we have a quorum, so we can do that. Um, a request from Amherst Cinema, report on the Affordable Housing Trust, updates HRC bylaw and our state of the human rights report from last time and update to the community events group. And finally, the Latinx Heritage Month. And then we'll have public comment again and HRC member reports and set the next date and discuss any additional topics not covered. So are there any questions or additional topics? Deborah? <laughs> I don't know if this is an appropriate agenda item, but I just returned from vacation and I read an article about how concerned um, the social justice committee was around not having sufficient membership. And I don't know if this commission acts in allyship with other committees or if there is a role, but it occurred to me maybe a conversation about it may be a good idea. So I'll just add that for our discussion as to whether there's a role for an HRC in this whole question of the uh, Social Justice Committee not having a forum and that role. Okay, any other agenda items? All right, so um, let's open up to public comment. And let me just note that uh, to the public, members of the public, if there is anyone, when called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name, preferred pronouns, and residential address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the chair, based upon the number of people who wish to speak. No speaker can cede their time to another speaker. The HRC will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. So I'm now opening us up for public comment. Jen, you have your hand up. I do. I just want to say you should do a check-in with all the members to make sure they can uh, be heard in, uh, after okay. the public comment period. Okay, so let's do public comment first. Are there any comments? Since there's only one person in the public and there isn't anyone else, I'll assume we're done with public comments. So you said uh, I need to check in with everyone. So is that like attendance? Um, okay, Deborah. Here. Okay, Liz. <laughs> Present. Laverne. Here. Tyler. Here. And um, who is not here? Jacinta is not here. I think everyone else is here who needs to be here, right? Okay. Um, all right. Let's begin with the first agenda item. It is the uh, Citizens for Juvenile Justice. I believe we have a representative here. So why don't I ask you to speak? Can the person speak? I've tried pulling them in, okay. and I, Pamela probably did. Anna, Anna Bedell, if you unmute yourself, you can speak. Hi. Am I on now? Excellent. 
Um, thank you all so much. Um, before I jump in, I'm, I have a look. Power, would it be helpful to have a PowerPoint, or do you want everything to be oral? Because if you want a PowerPoint, happy to do it. I just need the sh the share screen ability. Otherwise, happy to do it all verbally. What's your preference? I'm going to defer to Jen about whether we have the capacity to give her access to her presentation. If we do, then I would suggest giving her the access. I don't, um, let's see. And if it's too much I trouble, think, it's fine. No, no, I think just Pamela needs to do it because she came in first. And so just as I'm co-host, I don't have an opportunity to make you a co-host. Um, I think I got it now. We're good. All right. Um, thank you all for uh, and, um, allowing me to present to all of you today. My name is Sana Fadel. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Deputy Director of Citizens for Juvenile Justice. Um, I really appreciate uh, being mem uh, on, on, this, on this call with you all today. Um, just to let you know, I have been reaching out to human rights commissions, racial, racial justice, grassroots organizations, and other groups, um, allied groups across the state um, on a campaign that we're working on to try to raise the profile of a youth justice reform that um, CFJJ, along with our allies across the state, are pursuing. Um, so before jumping in, Citizens for Juvenile Justice is uh, I'm just I'm who we are. We are it's a statewide policy organization. We advocate on behalf of young people who are either at risk of or with legal system involvement. Um, our target population are those from birth until limit 20s. We do everything from preventing entry into the legal system. So things like the child welfare to prison pipeline, the school to prison pipeline, um, up until doing work around reducing the harms of legal system involvement, knowing that young people will get in trouble with the law. How do you make sure that the legal system itself at all decision points from the beginning all the way to the end, um, um, including re-entry and collateral consequences is developmentally appropriate and you, treats young people as children and adolescents that will have the potential and, and, and ability to grow and mature out of offending, but also as young people who who's where the legal system intervenes with them in a way that's like that would be with any other adult may not work because of their age. Um, so we do that through policy research and advocacy and coalition building. Um, so I'm here to present to you about one of our campaigns um, that we are trying, I guess I mentioned earlier, trying to raise a, a statewide profile on at the, at the grassroots level. A lot of folks hear about criminal justice reform and think automatically mass incarceration. Our focus, because of our focus is on young people, we're not, for us, mass incarceration is actually too late in the game. We're looking early on, what can we do as young people to prevent young people even entering the legal system to make them even eligible for incarceration? So we're not looking only at incarceration, we look at arrest, prosecution, um, criminal records, probation, all sorts, of, all sorts of decisions. And one of the campaigns that we are, um, hoping to pitch to all to you to today um, to get your support or help it, helping at, um, helping promote this campaign would end the automatic prosecution of all teenagers at, at, as adults. So as you all know, legally you're 18 and a, you're an adult. Our legal system has, we have two separate legal systems, the juvenile system and the adult system. The juvenile, once you hit 18, you're automatically prosecuted as an adult and there is no, there's no, qualifier there's there's no difference between an 18 year old and a 30 year old or a 50 year old in the eyes of the law in the adult system um this is i think maybe the fourth session or fifth session um that we have been trying to pursue this and we're we're really really close so one of the things we want to do is get get that push from grassroots folks um so i'll, I'll start with why this matters um, like i mentioned we have two separate systems the juvenile system by law is created so that, and I'm going to quote you the law, that children who get in trouble with the law are not, um, are, shall not be treated as criminals, but shall be treated as delinquents who the, where the state shall guide them as close to what a parent would do. So when we talk about the system, even though both systems have a record, you have a court record, you have incarceration, um, it does, you know, regardless of what system you're in, it derails your ability to maintain, you know, it, 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 um, it, it puts barriers to your, your education, it family ties and 
or so forth. However, one system is geared towards exclusively for adolescents and thinking, okay, how, how can we intervene with young people better and appropriately? So I'm gonna go for the, for the back end. When we have young people, um, so we have young people up until the age of 21 under certain circumstances who are incarcerated into our juvenile justice system. But once you hit 18, if your offense starts at 18, you're in the adult system, all that, you know, for, for moving forward, no no going back. So when you look at that age, that age cohort of kids coming out, young people coming out of incarceration, which is the deepest end, like every decision is like, are we going to keep you out of our society? So when, with the final answer, yes. So you need to be sentenced to incarceration because this is the, the most appropriate response. Then you say, okay, so what's the outcome? First outcome is we have we have a high rate of recidivism, and recidivism means you know someone comes in, they come out of the incarceration, and whoop they're they're in trouble again for a totally new offense. And these these points one is the rearrangement is like you went to court, and there you know you have a court and court case on a totally new offense. Conviction means you've been found guilty of that new offense. And if you look at the age cohorts, young people coming out of adult incarceration have double the recidivism of young people coming out of the juvenile system. So again, we talk, we use a lot, for those of you in the public health world, we use the harm reduction language a lot because it's not a panacea, we're not gonna solve anything, but this is very significant because what we hear in the adult system, all these young people are violent, they're, um, they're all we hear is violence and they're not gonna listen and they're, they do their own thing. And I'm like, yeah, they're a bunch of teenagers. Um, but because the orientation is so different, we have this worse public safety outcome. I'm not going to focus there. What I'm going to focus on why and the the so the social justice and economic justice angle of this. So what we know is the young people are the same. They're adolescents. Their brains are maturing at that, you know, at that at each age is different stage, but they're all in the process of maturing and to, to towards full adulthood. But when we do a legal system intervention that delays what young people need to mature, that's education, employment, family, um, physical and mental health, and civic engagement. If we put barriers to those, you're delaying young people meet, meeting their, their developmental milestones. If you remove some of those barriers, you're helping them meet, reach those developmental milestones. And that's important because developmental milestones are directly tied to aging out of offending. So when we have a, an adult system, a criminal legal system that says, oh, you have a quarry, uh, we, we don't care about education. You're an adult now. There's no no role for family. We actually put that's one of the major factors that's resulting in this high recidivism. But here's and and this this is tied by research. And I'm happy to send you this PowerPoint. I'm not going to go into every slide for time sake. But this this is tied to research that followed 1,300 young people over a seven year period and asked them. And all of them have a, a committed serious violent offenses as teens and ask them, why did some of them desist from crime? Why did some of them persist in crime? And the, and the, the answer was, the, no, none of these, none of the things that most people think are the case, you know, demographics, substance abuse, housing, mental illness, none of that. It was, the, um, I'm going to focus on number two, which is meeting their developmental milestones on time. Um, but this is where it comes in. There's also a racial justice issue. So when we're talking about our legal system, it is not an equal opportunity employer. Our legal system targets disproportionately low income communities and young people and, and, and communities of color, particularly men of color. So when we're looking at, this is just as pure incarceration, where we have high disparity, and, and because we I use like state and national data, national data on uh, Latino to white disparities isn't as good as black to white. So this is the only one I can analyze, but you'll see for that age cohort, they have the highest rate of racial disparities of any age group. In the juvenile system, if I gave you this presentation about like six years ago, it would have been a 10 to one disparity. Sorry about the background noise. If it was, um, if it was two years ago, it would have been nine to one. Now it's seven to one. There is a reason for that. Our juvenile system has a federal and state requirement to reduce racial disparities, not to just document it. 
we still have a long, long way to go. But at least that, this is where there's a harm reduction, there is a, a, a difference. But in addition to the disparities, when we're talking about a legal system that prevents young people from you know, being, being intervened with in an appropriate way, focuses on punishment than rehabilitation, has more consequences. And then you have more young people of color in that. We're talking about long-term consequences that are beyond just incarceration that are disproportionate. And finally, and, and I do want to talk about the economic impact. So when you prosecute a young person as an adult, and there's, a, um, and I shared earlier, like a full statement giving you the research behind all of these statements. But the first one is, when it, it, it derails young people's education. You are, um, we actually put, CFJJ put out a report recently around access to education, um, to young people for young people who are in juvenile system compared to those in adult system. The juvenile system, if you're in the juvenile system, you're in school five and a half hours a day. There's no summer school. Uh, sorry, there's no summer vacation. In the adult system, about a, ha a handful of young people who are federally have a right to special education can't even act, are the ones who got it. After all the young people who are incarcerated in our system, depending on the on the facility, because there is a focus on education. So when you're looking at, and plus when you come out of the criminal justice system, you have a core, you have an adult criminal record that is accessible to the public. A juvenile record is confidential. So those two things, access to employment and education, those are gonna hold for young people for a long, long time. So first thing, by derailing the ability to, to have, to, to continue their education and ability to get, and it, it limits their employment opportunities, it diminishes their own lifetime economic earnings. Second, because we're we're limiting that for a, a cohort of young people from every generation, we're talking about we also have an economic, um, a labor market gap. It predates COVID. COVID just made it worse. So in 9, 2017, 2018, I would, economists were testifying at the state house about the lack, uh, the a huge gap in our employment where we have a a significant population baby boomer population that is retiring and not enough young people to cap to capture those same same positions they've been doing that since before covid so when we're saying okay but for some young people you're not going to get you're not going to be really ready for the marketplace we're perpetuating that gap and instead we're arguing by raising the age and giving them that employment and access because even though their legal system involved, giving them better opportunities for employment and, and, and um, education, you're actually gonna help the labor gap as well. Um, we're also talking about that there, by saying that this, this cohort of young people is not gonna be part of our fully part of, part of our formal economy, we're, having, we're depriving our communities of, uh, of their economic potential. And particularly because of, I'm gonna go back earlier, I talked about the legal systems over, over um, involvement in communities of color and low income communities, particularly for black and brown men, young men. We are depriving those young people, the, their, their communities from their economic potential. And this one actually started digging into the economic research, having spoken to um, an, an adult now who was incarcerated as a young person and was telling me like, we, we all me and my you know co cohort in our in who are incarcerated who all came in as teenagers our fam not only are we not able to participate economically in our families and in our communities now our own families have to work double or get you know work harder to make up for us and then we come back they have to even do more get more put a more economic burden on them to take care of us so th there's a there's a there's an economics um, the, the 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 suck of the, econ the economic um, deprivation also extends to their those communities as well. And then finally, I, I mentioned earlier we could potentially reduce crime in half by this only not not all crime just, just by reoffending in half by this cohort. By doing that, we act, there is an economic value to reduced crime whether it's to taxpayers and to, to vict potential victims. Um, and I want to say, we, this is not unique. This is, we actually, our legal system is one of the last systems that looks at 18 year olds and said, nope, you're an adult, we're done, to, you're on your own. You know, we, you can't own a gun, you can't smoke, you can't have, um, you can't do pot, gamble, sports betting now, until you're 21. We also, 
we also say like, you know, if you're in state involvement and in child welfare or even near healthcare, uh, education, none of those end at the age of 18. They, they continue into the early, late adolescence to say, we need to be there for you. The reason we do that is that our society does not have a hard line of adulthood. Yes, you can vote, you can sign a contract, you can get married at 18, you can go to, go to war. But what we try to do is you can get a job at 14, you can start driving at 16 and a half, you can pre-register to vote. Um, some places want 16, 17 year olds to vote in local elections where it's around education and schools. But you want to delay things like drinking and getting a gun, even drive, renting a car. All of those because we have a trend. Our society says we have a transition to adulthood, not a hard line. Things that are pro-social that we want young people to engage in frequently and maintain and have habits in, we try to expose to them, expose them to that earlier. Things that are risks to themselves or others, we want to delay. And our argument is legal system involvement because of the long-term risks and community risk. That is something worth delaying until they're fully into you know, into age twenty-one. I'm not. Um, I do before. I'm not going to go into the difference, but I do want to end with the, just this: where there, the, our juvenile justice system, with all its harms, which is why we exist, does look at young people differently. This is a quote from our, our former commissioner who talked about young people as assets to be developed, not problems to be fixed. This is very much in contrast where a former sheriff I spoke to and who said, these are the most dangerous people, not thinking about, well, what is our intervention that is leading to that behavior? They are the same exact young people. Um, so I do wanna end with just what, what I ask is in the pitch. Um, if this is something that you're interested in, I'm happy to answer your questions, look into. But like I mentioned when I first started, we're really looking at grassroots support um, across the state for this campaign. We really want to make sure legislators know that this particular reform is some something that um, their communities care about. So we'd love to get, you know, if this is something that HRC, um, that your HRC is willing to publicly endorse. I know there's a voting process because of your um, because of your role. Great. Um, some some HRCs are able to endorse, some aren't, and those who, and either one have also been able to say we can publicize it, we can drive drive individuals or our members or our constituencies um, to this campaign to have them to learn about. If you're able to endorse, there's things we can ask you to do, like, like letters of support or, or make any connections in there. So um, just uh, I want to say thank you all so much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, Ms. Fadel, thank you so much for your presentation and all that good information. Uh, I think we really would like to see the PowerPoint because uh, there's a lot in there. Um, are there any reflections? Uh, I assume that at some point we'll have to discuss, uh, look at the information you've submitted and discuss how and whether we want to be involved. But for now, are there any questions, reflections from the commission? I have a hand up, it's just in the light. Um, so oh, sorry, it, yeah, Deborah, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't so, see it. I just wanna thank you for coming and thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, thank you for the thoroughness of your research and um, the power of your argumentation on you know, why what you're advocating is important and right. Thank you. I have just one question uh, before we let you go. I mean, how did you come up with 20? Did it seem like a good advocacy approach? Uh, I've been involved in some international efforts and usually they say 24 because there's some brain study around when all of that actually settles. Um, so I'm just curious why you came up with 20. Um, we actually had to work with our, you know, um, Specifically, we always worked with DYS and say, "What you know, this this is who you want to work with." So let me let, actually let me backtrack. We um we we were instrumental in passing a, a criminal justice reform back in 2018. One of the and we uh, that was actually when we first proposed raising the age and what we wanted to raise actually shift the entire age of the juvenile justice system because at in by 2018, the juvenile justice jurisdiction was from age seven until the 18th birthday. We were like, that is too young on this end. 
and not old enough on this end. So our proposal was to raise the age to to, to 12 so that no elementary school students are part of are, can ever be arrested and raising it to include 18, 19, 20 year olds. The, that, the law did include, the, we got the first part. We actually, the we're the first state in the country to raise the lower age so that no one under the age of 12 can be arrested. And unlike other states, there's no carvas. There's, there's no other ability, no other, uh, no offense that can get you arrested. And that was important because our juvenile justice system is not, it's not, a, a slap in the hand. A lot of folks think, oh, it's just, it's, it's kitty court or something like that. It's a, it's a legal system. It has its repercussions. I was just talking to someone yesterday who is a contractor and he's, I want to say like 35. And he's like, something happened at 15 is haunting me. Another person, I think she was 60, she's 65 and a teacher, something that at, at a 12 year old is still haunting her. Someone who's currently incarcerated, something that happened to him as, as a, something he did when he was 10, is still haunting him. It is not something, it is not a benign intervention. And when we talk to our DPOS, we're like, it is an intent, we have control over your body legally and every decision we have control over. It's pretty significant. So they say what we want are those who really need this level of intervention to get back on the right track. The intense, mm -hmm. intensivity of the, uh, the rehabilitation and the being in close contact. So as I'm getting to your answer. The crazy thing is you have all these young people all together. So one of the things we wanted to make sure is the age cohort is appropriate. And that's why we talked with DYS where they said, yes, I can have, I can see someone at this age, um, at this, at, this is the age we can do. But once you hit 23, I don't think this is the appropriate side because you don't want them with a 12 year old or a 15 year old. So our position is 21 is the closest to, you know, the guns and alcohol, all that stuff. That makes sense. And we're actually, also, so we have another campaign that looks at the adult system and incorporating developmentally appropriate interventions in the adult system for the 21 to 25 year olds. Sorry, I, I, I give lot long. No, thank you very much. Than, <laughs> and I'm thorough instead of sure. Well, very, very sympathetic. I, I have no doubt that we can speak about this for days on end, but we do appreciate you coming to us today and for your concise presentation. Um, are there any further questions before we end this? I think I have a question and or a comment. Go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, did you say that there was going to be like, you said 12 to 20, but then you said something about like 20 to 25. Is that like a separate category and then adult would start at 25 or st because here's my question or maybe my concern or my comment, I, I don't know which it is. Um, in the educational system, you can remain in high school until you're 22. And since you have an educational, vocational rehabilitation um, aspect to your presentation, I was wondering if it wouldn't be more doable if the age was 22 as it is for high school and stuff like that while I'm in the back of my head thinking about your statement about not having these half adults or many adults in the same um, demographic or same area with 12 year olds. So it's kind of, yes, I agree. No, I don't agree. But um, education is 22 for high school. So I was just wondering why the age would not just go and follow that track. Um, I 100% agree with you. And I think it's brilliant. It's politics as well. We have a lot of opposition. Like they were like, I, I, this is literally 18 and 19 has the word teen in it, 20 doesn't. So maybe we can get 18 and 19 year olds. Oh, I, I think let's try 18 year olds and maybe, and, and, let's do, and see how it goes. So like even making it to 21, the 21st birthday is really, really hard, but that's our goal. Um, we do have, like I mentioned, we had us, we have a campaign around um, a development appropriate reforms in the adult system. We can't do the whole thing. Like ju ju the, raise the age is about everything from arrest, records, prosecution, interrogations, all, all sorts of things. For us to do the same thing in the juvenile on the adult system, we're doing one thing at at a time. And that is education. We are trying to say that if you are a young person under the age of 
I think under the age of 22 for this other bill, you shall have, and you're incarcerated, and again, only incarceration, not all the other steps. You will be, you will have a right to be in school six hours a day, every every day of the week, you know, weekends, but uh, including summer. That is going to be a heavy lift because when we do the, did this campaign and we said, well, raise the age, we'll fix it, but you still have the 21 year olds. So yes, there's there, that is a very very key issue. Politically, it's going to be very very hard for us to get. 21 year olds and adults in the in, in raise the age. Um, so so that's why we're doing it a two part. Ideally, they would say, we you know what, this is too much work. This juvenile system have them. Um, but I do want to be respectful that DYS says if I get a 22, 22 year old at the time of their offense, I won't have much. I'll I'll have like a year maybe to work with them, which is not going to be enough. So there's there's some like administrative stuff on the juvenile system as well, as well as the politics. But I'm 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 100% with you because it would make life easier. But it's no, thank you. Other questions or comments? I would just like to ask if you can forward me the PowerPoint so I can send it to the commissioners, just to the human rights email, please. I will do that. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I really look forward to delving into all the material. Um, and I'm guessing what you're asking of us is some kind of endorsement that would include one or more of the actions on your action PowerPoint. I just wanted to confirm that. Yes? Yes, yes, that would be, and I, I don't know if that's a vote or a discussion, so whatever, I will follow your lead on that, but that is the request. Okay, great, thank you very much. Thanks for coming and speaking with us and for your commitment and work. Thank you all so Thank much you. and I appreciate your time. So um, we move on to the next agenda item, which is the nomination of a co-chair. Um, I'll just say that as you know, probably I think this is really important and you all do and that's why you're all here. And I'm really looking for good strong support. So if you'd like to volunteer or nominate someone, uh, please do so, we have a quorum. So we can do it today, now. I just wanna say I appreciate and am sympathetic to the position you're in, but I have a standing policy of never being a chair or co-chair until I've been on a body for a year, because I think that's just absurd. So um, there's just no way I think I or the other new member should be in the pool, but I'm hoping somebody who's been on the board on the commission longer will raise their hand. Is there an opinion about that before we I put forward something. So I am not raising my hand. However, I did have a conversation with Ronnie and for at least the next year, if nominated, I will not decline. Get, but also the commission needs to know my other parameters of, of meeting times and dates that um, exist with um some of my other responsibilities. I'll leave it at that. Okay. So I called for a nomination of Liz Haywood. Good. I don't know if I can nominate as a co-chair, but our members should. Can Pamela and Jen advise? Yeah. Can I, I do the nomination? I will nominate her if I can. Yeah, I, I think that you you can go go ahead and do that. Um okay. So I hereby nominate Liz Haygood as co-chair of the Human Rights Commission. And I ask for a second. I second. And vote, please. If you're in agreement, say yes. Raise your hand. No, well, I don't see Tyler. <laughs> right. So, oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. OK, thank you, Tyler. Okay, um, I think we have oh, a quorum. I, vote? I mean, can I vote? And I, yes, you can vote for yourself. We assume you have. <laughs> Great. 
Congratulations, and I'm very, very thrilled to have a co-chair, and I appreciate all that experience. I'm exactly the person that Deborah said shouldn't be a co-chair, but here I am. You're stuck with me, uh, and but you have Liz, who does have the full experience uh, to be a co-chair, I guess. So um, with that, shall we move on to the next agenda item? Yes. Um, it's uh, we have a request from Amherst Cinema con concerning a trans film series that they're about to put on. Uh, has everyone read what that is? It was in the package. Um, I don't know that that one was put in the package, but I believe not that okay. it got sent to no. everyone. I, I saw can... something about that in in the in the um agenda and i also read there was like a couple of pages of things that were going to be going on mm -hmm. it just seemed like there are some events that amher cinema is um leading or holding um to sort of make more prominent trans voices i let pamela talk about it because she knows more about all this so um i met with the development officer from uh Amherst Cinema earlier in the week, and they are looking for support from the town of Amherst for the uh, film series they're doing on trans stories in, I believe it's October, September to October. I'm not sure of the exact dates. Um, I have shared their request with a few other departments, the Senior Center, Rec, um, the Crest Department, and the hope is that uh, the four departments will be able to join together to um, do sponsorship as the town of Amherst. And if that's the case, um, we're looking to have sponsorship at the $500 level. So that would be $125 from each area. Um, and um, all of the departments would be listed and the town of, Am uh, of Amherst would be listed as a co-sponsor. The uh, reason or one of the reasons why it um, came to the HRC is because you have a separate fund that would allow for us to make a contribution. The senior center has a friend's account uh, again. So, there, so, so for procurement and financing um, reasons, it would need to come through the HRC if you're willing to willing to su to support. So the um, financial amount would at the most would be 125. Um, the support would list the town of Amherst and then the four departments um, that are would be contributing to Amherst Cinema. Um, and I I'll say um, the senior center and I tried to work with Amherst Cinema um, last year on a couple of events and we were not successful, but we are hoping that there will be better collaboration around the promotion of different events in the future. And um, so we're hoping uh, literally that this will buy us a little goodwill. <laughs> so. so I have two concerns. Mm -hmm. The first concern is um, if we have reached out to them to for their support of us and it didn't work out. And I don't know the particulars as why it didn't work out, but then it's kind of interesting that you would come back around and ask us for something to support you. However, I'm hoping that the support is not the Amherst Cinema, but the support is our trans youth and adults in our community. So that's kind of, I keep saying the positive and the negative in the same statement. <laughs> the second concern is we pledge 125. The other three entities or two of the three entities or one of the other entities does not. Does that mean that we need to dig into our pockets to give more to make up for the 500 or will the 125 be sufficient regardless? Right. So I think I've I have already received a firm yes from the senior center. Um, the rec department is um, is considering it, and I have not had a chance to 
um, have a conversation with uh, Earl or with Kat from Cress, I feel fairly confident that the four, between the four departments, we will be able to get to $500. Um, and I do um, also uh, share your first concern around, um, around the fact that we, so both Al, um, the former admin assistant from the senior department and I both reached out to um, Amherst Cinema um, and, and I don't quite understand why we weren't able to get to yes, um, but um, I do think that uh, the conversation I had with the development officer was a good one and I think it's going to be more difficult for them not to be supportive and collaborative with the town around different events um, when we have shown that we're willing to be supportive in uh, of them. So, you know. Other thoughts? <laughs> Just raise your hand or speak if you have your hand up and I don't call you. Because I think I'm not seeing hands. Um, I guess my take, oh, Tyler. Uh, is there any chance of someone from the cinema coming before the commissioner, even just before anyone from the town um, jointly to discuss this? Since right now it sort of seems like we're going off of some pretty general materials that they provided and um, more intermediary approach. I think it would be a little easier to address some of these questions if we actually had a representative from the cinema talking to us. Well, I'm sure that I can reach out to the development officer. Um, uh, but I mean, I did have a conversation directly with the with the development officer. I don't necessarily feel that you're, you would get more information than you're getting from uh, from the person than I'm able to relay. Um, but I, you know, we could certainly reach out. I mean, and then this is your decision. If you choose not to do it, that's you know your decision to de to decide. What exactly would the money be going towards? I know they want to bring programs here. Mm -hmm. Are they trying to give an honorarium to some of the speakers? Are they trying to raise money so folks can go into a film or two for free? I mean, what is it that so they're asking? I, I thought that that information had been sent out to the entire um, commission. And the last page it that list what the um, event sponsorship would be. I don't have it right in front of me, but um, basically we would be a sponsor of the of the last event. So the last film in the series, if you chose to do it. Um, I did, when I spoke with the development officer, uh, say to, that, uh, to the officer that the wills, because they were looking for an answer um, like the last week in August. And I said, you know, the wills of municipal government move a little bit slower. So there's no guarantee that I could have an answer by um, August. So in discussions with the development officer, um, we came to an agreement that if the town did to decide to go forth with the sponsorship, that it would be of the, la the fourth event in the series that would give a little bit more time to have all four departments make a decision about support and get that firmed up. Um, if uh, so, that would I mean it's that at your next meeting, which would be uh, in September, um, there is a possibility that the development officer could appear and you could make a decision. I'm hoping that the um, other departments will have already reached their decisions by the, um, by that time. And as I said. You know, the senior center has already um, given a firm commitment to, to join in the effort. And it was the senior center that was looking to um, to get assistance from Amherst Center. So they had certainly more at stake um, than any of the other departments. So my hand is up. Um, 
at $125, my first inclination was to say, well, sure, why not? Um, but Liz, you're asking some fantastic questions. And um, I just reread really quickly what they say sponsorship is about. And um, it, it seems like a classic business sponsorship thing. It's like, you give us money and we give you visibility. You get your logo out there, right? So I think it's really, uh, <laughs> it's an interesting thing to ask a municipality to um, engage in that kind of marketing. I mean, that's really what, you know, the payment is. It seems like a classic marketing thing. So I don't have any opposition to it. I also think Liz's question about, you know, uh, what are we doing to support trans folks in Amherst, you know, in, you know, the individuals themselves uh, is a really great question. So um, yeah, now that I look at it through this like capitalist frame, I'm like, huh, it's only $125, but huh, I don't know. I don't, you know, we don't have a lot of money. Yeah, well, I was just looking, I just went back and was reading the whole thing. So it is like a sponsorship and we would get um, a logo in their brochure and let other people know in the town that we support trans youth and trans adults and whatever. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm not totally in opposition. The, like, again, I'm going to trust and maybe I shouldn't, but I'm going to trust that. And I hope somebody from their um, entity is actually goes back and hears the, these notes. But if we are now giving you a little grain, the next time you decide that you can't work with us on something we need from you, that's not going to look good. And um, since it's already happened, that is my pause. Though I will not um, be in opposition if that's what most of the commission would like. Okay, so my view uh, is really that given everything that's been going on with our kids in Amherst, it's really important that this program happens. And maybe I'm too close to the corporate world in my professional life. But basically, they're probably having to pay to show these, to acquire these films and show them. And I'm guessing that's where the money is going. It's very hard when there's a small amount of money like this. Also, having been in these shoes, when the donor says, well, I want to know exactly where my money is going, it's very difficult to point that out. Um, I guess I don't know the history of what they said no to, but my decision about giving would be based on whether it's something that I value giving to. And it wouldn't be based on whether they're giving me back money or not. Uh, but I don't know the background to all of this. So I guess I'm inclined uh, personally to just give them the money. I like Tyler's idea a lot of just having them Talk to us a little bit more about like why this, why now, what's all this about? Like you don't really get that background from their written material. Why these movies? How were they chosen? What is it we're trying to accomplish? Which tells you more about what is the substantive commitment of Amherst Cinema to this cause that they're uh, proposing to put forward? Or are they just doing it because it's the thing of the moment? I don't know. I assume it's somewhere in between. But giving is easier if you understand that you're part of this bigger agenda of change or addressing something bad that happened. Uh, so I, I, that part I sort of see. Um, so shall we just take a vote or do you want to, do you all want to think about it more? Uh, my inclination is to take a vote and if we say yes or yes, but or Laverne, you haven't said anything. Do you have something you want to share? Or well, well, don't we have to take a vote because it's yeah. the deadline's the twenty sixth. So well, we can wait to next month to take the vote. That's one of the things being discussed. But I would suggest taking a vote now, so we know if there's an issue, we know about it. Are we ready to vote? So I make a motion that the Human Rights Commission allocates $125 towards the uh, series um, supporting our trans community. I hope that's enough. If not, if Pamela, correct me. That's it. 
We need Any a second. I second. Oh, okay. Laverne. Okay, so um, all in favor, raise your hand. Wait a minute. My hand's up. <laughs> okay. All right, I think then we're set to go. Uh, just to be sure, does that, would anyone like more information in addition to committing to give the money? If we want more information, Liz and Tyler both raised some questions. We can still ask them for that information. To be say yes, but also and also ask for more information. Well, I went back and looked at what they're trying to present. So for me, I don't really need any more information. And I only would like to have a discussion again, if in fact, for one of our, whether it's CSSJC or the town or HRC or Crest or whoever's giving, ask them to support something if there's a negative response to that or a not a meeting of the minds, then, um, then I would rather have a discussion at that point. But I'm good for now. I don't know about anybody else, only speaking for myself. Um, Tyler, I'm, I'm assuming you're good since you haven't said anything. Um, so we move on to the next thing, next agenda item then. Okay, so uh, it's Liz reporting on the Affordable Housing Trust. So um, we have to meet again. We met, oh goodness, I wanna know what the date was. It was the first or the second Wednesday in July um, around our listening session that we co-sponsored with the Affordable Housing Trust and um, Erica is putting together a slate of themes that then we were going to um i think we're meeting again mm, i gotta ask her because a lot of people have been on vacation of course but our hope is to make a presentation to the town council and then we were wondering if we should hold off until after the elections because there's some hot people going in and trying to upseat some of the electors, the the not the electors, the folks that are already seating. So um, that's the update for now. And again, we're still continuing to look at ways to support um, folks who need affordable housing in Amherst and surrounding areas. Any questions on that? All right, um, so Pamela, the HRC bylaw. So I've had a discussion with Paul about the HRC bylaw. Um, he's asked me to put together um, a chart that would uh, show him clearly what the original language is and what your suggested changes are. He, um, I mean, he has both that information, but it would like it in another format to make it more um, easier for him to review. Uh, and I've promised that I would have that to him. He's away on vacation this week. I leave for vacation tomorrow. I'm back in the office on Tuesday. My plan is to give him the chart on Tuesday, and then he will review it and make um, whatever decisions he's going to make. So it's moving along um, slowly, but it is moving forward. And then the state of human rights, I think Philip reported that um, the uh, town council has knowledge received, but they have not given us a date when they plan to discuss it. So I am um, I'm sorry for interrupting, but I received an email um, from a town council uh, president with a suggested date, and I thought that it was her intent to send that to you, um, Ronnie, to, um, you haven't received it? No. Okay. So the, um, I can, um, 
I can forward you the email that I received from her. I, I, I believe I can do that. But I don't know if there's any. You other. just tell us the date so everyone knows. I, I, I no? don't re quite recall all the okay. dates, but, uh, um, but I, I do know that she did send me an email with dates. And I think that that was the, um, uh, so I can forward it to you to, to so that you can um, be in communication with her. But I know that uh, that there was a plan to provide a date for discussion and presentation. So I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't yeah. recall the exact date, but I can forward you her email. Um, but isn't it practice if they want to communicate to us that they write to the co-chairs? Well, that's what I thought. Uh, but she would write to you, but not yeah. to... Maybe it's time to notify her that Liz is a co-chair and really she should be communicating well, with both of us. Well, I actually, that's why I'm surprised that you uh -huh. have not heard from her because that's, um, she asked the question about uh, about the uh, co-chairs and I provided her with that information. So it was my, it was my thinking that she would have communicated uh -huh. with you directly by now. So yeah, that, okay. that is certainly what she has done in the, in the past. Okay. Um, so I'm Great. not sure why that hasn't occurred, but that was certainly what was um, that was what was relayed to me was her intent was to to was to be in contact directly with you about a date. So as soon as we know the date, we will share with everyone, and I would very strongly urge members of the commission to be present when our report is discussed. I know that a lot of us are new, like me. I don't have the background on some of the cases presented, but we should still hear um, what the town council has to say about it, uh, thinking about next year. We'll share that with you as soon as we know. Um, and then what's the next one? Community events. Yep. So I no, said I don't really know what that is, so I'm passing it to you. So I'm not sure if you all know that there is a number of people that are running for town council and school committee. There's a number of seats being vacated in the school committee and a number of well, it's an election year for both. Um on Saturday from ten to twelve at the Unitarian Universalist Society. Um, 121 North Pleasant Street, there is a meet the candidates. So a number of new candidates. I know Allegra Rice will be there and Martha Toro and some others. If you want to meet some of the folks that are running for school committee and town council, they will be there um, at this event. So if anybody's interested. Okay, I'm, now I'm understanding what this is. Are there community events that we should know about that are coming up? Yeah, well, so there, I sent everybody a PDF of a, of a spreadsheet that was last minute right. added to the, the packet. Uh -huh. So that has a list of all of the ones that the HRC in the past year has been celebrating or have thought about celebrating. The second page, I believe, has the ones for DEI, and then the third page has a list of just the different events that I had a calendar a while ago and added it to the calendar that Pamela and I created of different cultural and heritage events. So my guess it would be is it's really up to you guys to take a look at it, but that's what is there. Um, because Several of us are new. Uh, it would really be helpful to know a little bit about what HRC has done with regard to these events in the past. Um, yeah. It's something we've taken a stand on. And then just for other people's information, we have talked about having some kind of retreat to sort of orient ourselves a little bit because a lot of us are new. Um, and to be clear on our goals and our priorities as we go into the next year. So I'm also thinking of that. Oh, at the retreat, yeah. So do you want me to share screen? Mm -hmm. I can do that. And Pam, while she's doing that, Pamela, could you, you had something to say? 
She's muted. I was just going to um, suggest that at a minimum, we finalize the date for the Latinx Heritage uh, event. And um, and then perhaps you might consider what dates you would want for the retreat. But um, Latinx Heritage is coming up. Um, and then we there's a little bit of a, a gap um, between some of the other HRC events, but that's coming up very quickly. So we do need to finalize that date. And what happens on that date? What do we? So do? the last year, the Latinx Heritage event was held in uh, Kendrick Park. The, where, um, there's a hope um, to have the event um, on the town common. There is a um, generally a um, a bit of a conflict with the town common during this time of year because of the farmers market. At last year's event there, uh, which was an, an event that was free and open to the public, there was food, there was dancing, there were musical performance, um, there were um, some tables set up from, I believe from the um, at, from the school department, different had different tables. So there were a number of different activities and it lasted I want to say from 11 until 4, Jennifer will probably remember the exact um, um, time frame, but um, it, members of the HRC were there to, of course, help set up, um, help to serve food, um, help with organizing the um, entertainment that was there, and then, of course, uh, clean up as well. And last year, it was on a Saturday. Um, if the event is held this year on a Saturday, it would have to be uh, in the um, early after or late afternoon, early evening because of the farmer's market or the other option um, to have it on town common will be, would be to have it on a Sunday. So, and Jennifer can fill in more information about, about that. Yeah, so last year we had it at Kendrick Park because not only was there the, um, farmer's market, but there was another event on the common too. So the sooner we know, the faster we can check the dates with the DPW to see if the common is available. And then we also would need to pick a rain location. And we also need to check in with the school to see if they're going to participate and if those dates work. Mm -hmm. so but, the, um, dates, yeah. the, the dates we're looking at are these that you have on the list here, 916, 930, 1017, 10, 1014. Yeah, if if the common is available and we do it on Saturday, we would have to start after 230. And then I don't know, it probably gets dark around six o'clock by that time of the year. So you could do like two to five. Mm -hmm. Um, are there comments on the dates? Are there days when people want to do it and can help? Or days what when you cannot. Is, what time is the town common? I mean, what time is the farmer's market over? The farmer's market's over at two o'clock. So for us to be able to be there and set up, we wouldn't be able to start it too if they're breaking down their stuff at two. No, that's so, why I said like 2.30. Yeah. There's so, a section of it that they don't use, but... If you're going to have music, it's hard to put music on that. I'm going to reference that it's the southern end closest to Route 9 because Correct. you have so much traffic there. So it's hard to put any kind of music or entertainment there because there's more traffic on that side than there is on the north side. It just seems to me that it would be more feasible to have it on a Sunday as opposed to a Saturday if, in fact, we have to compete and just because they end it too doesn't mean they're not gone by 2.30 and we're starting at 2.30. I just can't see that changeover happening that quick for us to start at 2.30. And in fact, they're not gone. When I look, there's all sorts of lingering after the market. Uh, so I think it would be hard to start at 2.30 even if we want to be in that space. So Deb is um, Deborah's raising her, her hand. Uh, I'm really um, somewhere between disappointed and upset that 
September 16th is on this list. It's Rosh Hashanah. Um, there's lots of dates that aren't Jewish holidays that could be on the list. Um, Rosh Hashanah is both the 16th and 17th. The 30th is Sukkot, um, both the 30th and the next day. Um, the 7th is a lesser, uh, is an, also a holy day, Shemini Yatzer, but so le less people go. The 14th is free. Um, the 20, I'm not sure why the 23rd and 24th weren't on the list if we are including um, Saturdays because there's issues with Shabbat, but um, there's no holy days on, on those two days. So um, I'm assuming that this is what the majority wanted. And I guess what this raises is a curiosity about um, does the majority over, always rule or are there criteria by which we make decisions that um, allow for exceptions to majority rule? Because as all of us know who are members of um, populations that are not majority, majority rule doesn't always acknowledge or accommodate our needs and interests. So well, I just want to add quickly that it's only running from 950 the Hispanic Heritage Month runs from 9.15 to 10.15. That's why the other two dates aren't there. Um, and I apologize for not... September I mean, 23rd, I just, September no, 23rd September 23rd is not there. We can do it se 20, September 23rd and 24th is not listed. Is there something in conflict there? Because Hispanic Heritage Month runs from 9.15 from September 15th to October oh, no. 15th. September 23rd and September oh. 24th. There's a week, there's two weeks between 916 and 930 that does not oh. take into account for September 23rd and 24th. Yeah, I, well, we can aim for the 23rd if that works best for everyone. It doesn't work best for me because I'm, I'm busy somewhere else, but not to say that it shouldn't happen on that day. It just doesn't work for me. I um, don't know why the 23rd's not on there. I think we should respect holy days. I don't know what majority actually you're referring to, Deborah, but I do believe we should respect holy days. So I'm I, inclined to say that's where we should go, the 23rd, 24th. And the 14th also works great, or the 14th, 15th whatever those two days are. Those are actually the best. So since Liz has a conflict, maybe, you know, that works best for everyone. The reason I said majority is because it, all the dates weren't listed. So I was assuming oh, somehow. No, yeah. that was no. That was an oversight, oh, Deb. Wait, I think that, no, but I think that there is something on the 23rd and I just, you have to give me a minute to figure out what it was. But I'm not a hundred, I'm pretty sure there was something on the, 23rd that was going on. And I think if there's a cleanup day or something similar to that with the community participation officers. So then we still have the 14th, which would be within yeah. the Oh, within the wait, wait, back up a second, because I think the 14th might be the fall foliage, ABC fall foliage walk. So let me go back and see in my emails hold on I'm, I'm just gonna say that it is really stressful to try to pick a date where a there's not other conflicting events and um deborah i'm sorry we most definitely will uh i will pay more attention to the holy days for you i apologize or for everyone for that fact um so i apologize for that one and i just i have to say it's very hard to pick a, a date yeah, it's, thank you. Really I didn't hard. check the fall foliage. Is the fourteenth? I'm just it is back to the to the Sundays. Like, what about Sunday the fifteenth? So last year when we had it at Kendrick Park, we had the ABC fall foliage walk in the morning. I completed the walk and then went down to Kendrick Park for Latino Heritage Celebration. So we did have both on the same days, but again, if we're trying to hit the common the 14th would not work. It's already booked. So my view also on this is that competing other events are not the same as a holy day if, you're, if you have a religion for which it's a holy day. That's different from a competing other events. I feel like holy days are, mind you, I'm an atheist, but I've been taught this. I know how important holy days are to people. 
And that's not the same as just having an event. So I'd like to respect the holy days and work around what other days we have, whatever they are, even if they do conflict with fall walk. But we could well, do no, both. It sounds like we could do both, then we should. And if well, there's overlap, you... yeah. Well, the fall walk is on the common and it's the entire day. So we can't uh, have the common on the 14th. I see. I and that's the reason why mm -hmm. if I'm uh, recollecting, the reason why we had it at Kendrick Park last year was because of the walk in the common walk that was already on the common. So I do agree with you to respect people's um religious mm -hmm. affiliations. But we're looking mm -hmm. at a time where we need to have an event and the 14th is not a good day. Um, a lot of people participate in the ABC Fall Foliage Walk. Yeah, yeah. And I, so it's this is why it's so important for us to have the dates as soon as possible. If this, if we're gonna do it this way, because not only sometimes the I understand what you're saying, but the difference between the holy dates and the competing events. But it's hard when you have a competing event and the majority of the people you're losing out to people at some of those competing mm -hmm. events because and the ABC. Yeah fall foliage is you know what I mean if we're trying yeah. to have it at the common is is different than if it's like mm -hmm. you know so, so I, I, understand. I, I, Thank you. Repeat, I don't understand why we are keep focusing on where there's conflict and ignoring where there isn't so far we have not heard that there's a conflict on the 15th or the 24th for that matter so I'm just trying to ascertain why we're spending our time on the places where there is conflict Um, I'm not available the weekend of the 14th. So. And Jennifer, have you been able to figure out why the 23rd and 24th was not part of the equation? I think that there was a goal to try to push the events on to... I don't even know what to say about that, but to Saturday as opposed to Sunday. And so that's what I was asked, I, you know, that's what I did. And so um, the 23rd, there is a cleanup day scheduled. It was hard for me to look at my calendar when I had the screen share, because you guys were all going to have mm -hmm. the screen share up, mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. And was the push for Saturday from people saying that Saturday was their preferred day, or where did that come from? Like people on the commission, I mean. So the, as you guys will recall, I sent out an email to everyone asking oh, for, their preferred, for their preferred uh, dates. And um, as several of you uh, replied, several people did not reply. And there were definitely, there are conflicts among um, the individuals who did reply. So it looks like, um, uh, well, one, I had a question, which is, Jennifer, do we know what time the cleanup is? Is it um, all day on the 23rd? Um, and I guess this, it, from based on the conversation, it, might, it seems like maybe Sunday the 24th would be the best day for the majority of the people who are in attendance at this meeting. So the 20, Sunday, the so 20th. The yeah. cleanup day is scheduled from eight to 12, but I, so I won't, I can't, I don't, I can't do both of them. So yeah. you guys are welcome to do it on the 23rd. I will, I won't okay. be able to attend. Um, before we um, decide that, Tyler had his, has his hand up. Tyler, go for it. Uh, I, do I have my hand up? Yes. Uh, yeah, oh, my computer was saying that it wasn't. Uh, Oh, that now get rid gone. of it? Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. Because I don't think that I have a conflict with any of the dates, at least that I know of right now. Although the start of the semester is pretty hectic for me, but I don't think that I have any conflicts that I know of, so. And I guess I want to go back to, I, I know I just heard at least four people say Saturday's problematic because on the common there's the farmer's market and that you can't have access to it before two at the earliest, maybe later. And so I'm just confused again about why Saturday is being focused on if there's if, if there's a desire to have it on the commons. 
if it's going to be somewhere else, then that's a different story. I mean, I've been juggling these things and that's how events end up on a Sunday. That's otherwise I'm going to have to say as Pamela did that she sent something out and, and out of the group of people who responded, more people responded that Saturday was a better day outside of that. I, you know, that was it. So, so we it's fine why for me on a Sunday. Yeah, I also could do Sunday. I mean, I don't know which day I said, but if we're working with such a such a narrow window, I could do Sunday as well. I may have said Sunday, but I could have said Saturday. Uh, I'm willing to be flexible to find the day. Laverne, did you say you could do Sunday? Is that the weekend you said you wouldn't be here? The twenty fourth no, Sunday, the twenty fourth October of October fourteenth. October. Uh, so I can I can do Sunday. I just know I would prefer Sunday, Saturday, yeah. but Sunday is fine. Sunday the twenty fourth, you'll be here. So it looks like Sunday the twenty fourth works for everyone except Jen. Did you say that's a problem for you? The twenty fourth is not a problem. The cleanup oh, is on the twenty third. Okay. Awesome. It sounds like we've landed on a day. The next question um, is who's going to take the lead on this? <laughs> so, um, w uh, we, Jennifer and I had said before that we would try to take the lead on this first event um, to give the commission time to get uh, acclimated. So if we can uh, then have time to set a date for your retreat and go have everyone bring their calendars and go through the events and we can go through the explanation, but um, uh, we'll take the lead on this. Of course, we'll accept any help that we can get, but um, we'll we'll try to take the lead on putting this event together. I am definitely volunteering to help. I live so close to the common, it's easy for me. Um, I'm happy to help. Okay, anyone else want to volunteer right now? Did we choose a time? because I will be with the Family Center on Tuesday and Wednesday of next week, um, helping it with the backpacks. And I can talk to Dr. Gravara about having her um, dancing crew there um, this year as well, because they were fabulous last year. Well, they're fabulous all the time, but yeah, I will see her. So if I know a time, I could ask her about her um, group participating. Jennifer, do you have a suggestion for time for Sunday? Well, my next question would be, I guess it depends on what the, the group would like to do. So if you want to serve like, a, you know, usually those things, music and food. So you have to kind of design it. I've spoken to a few people in the community who gave suggestions of having food trucks and letting people pay for their food. Or we can do like last year where we went and bought the food. So you should think about that. You should also probably think about what, like if we need staging, some kind of, like what the performers other than the dancers from the high school might wanna do just to see what our other needs are first. But I would say, if you're gonna feed people, if we're gonna feed, if we're gonna provide lunch or people are gonna buy lunch, then I would say starting, um, 11 to 2, 11 to 3, somewhere in that time frame. If you just want to do finger foods and like snacks, um, then you can change it to 1, 2 o'clock to 3 or 4. So it really depends on what you guys would like to do. Can I maybe make a suggestion of just doing 1 to 3 and doing the food trucks and perhaps you and I can take a look at our budget to see if we can, um, if we're able to work out with food trucks, um, like, you know, a flat fee or discounted price that we can, um, so that we might be able to assist. One of the things that I really liked about that you were able to do for the um, 
AAPI was to get local vendors um, to go sort of 50% in, like the town did 50% and then they did 50% so of the pricing. So I think if if we agree on the time, maybe you and I can work on the uh, the fine details. Okay, I just, yeah. If, I mean, if, if, please, if you feel, you know, that that's otherwise, you know, please say so. But I'm thinking that if we can get agreement on the time, then the two of us can work on the on the other details. So I'm just keeping an eye on the clock and we're at eight minutes to eight o'clock. Um, was your suggestion, I think that it would be great if you could just keep us in the loop because we're only meeting once a month and ask for help, like, and then any of us can jump in. Um, and as far as the retreat is concerned, Pamela, was your suggestion that we should look at it at another time with our calendars in hand, or that we should talk about it now? Looks like setting a date is going to be hard. Uh, there are also doodle pool polls that you can use. I, I love those things. I, I don't know if everyone else does, but it's, you know. Yeah. So I think we could probably, um, um, based on the conversation that we have now, look for to send out a doodle poll for um, us. We, I think we met on a Sunday last year. Am I am I right, Jennifer, that we met on a Sunday? Correct. Or, yeah. So, and um, we basically went from nine until um, until one. But my suggestion actually is that if folks are really able to do a longer period of time, that we try to devote um, a, a longer period of time to the day. They were, we actually, the group was able to get a lot accomplished during the last retreat. And I can uh, send out on Tuesday uh, the minutes, I mean, we didn't take formal minutes, but sort of the summary of what the discussion was, but um, much as, um, as you've described, Ronnie, they, we talked about, like, the group talked about what their uh, goals were going to be for the upcoming year. Um, we, um, primarily, one of the, one of the primary things was the bylaws, and so I think that was a real successful process, but, um, I think we can probably next week send out a doodle poll with a couple of dates for Sundays in our, um, in October. We, and we know to stay away from that 15th Laverne because you weren't, aren't going to be available and then just select a date and, um, and select a time for the retreat. So. Okay. Well, so is there anything more we need to do with this or hopefully at the retreat, there's only one other thing that I see for this calendar. Oh, there's Indigenous People's Day too. All right, well, maybe we should discuss that next time. Um, and then there's Human Rights Day, right? Right, and, and Jennifer d does I, have, have some information about Human Rights Day. I know that you're uh, um, coming to the close, close to eight o'clock, maybe she can briefly talk about that. And then I just want to confirm, like, are, is everyone okay with Latinx heritage from, um, from, you know, 12 to three, or do you want a different time frame? That was just a suggestion by, by, uh, by me. It is totally up to this group to make a decision. Raise your hand if you're okay with it. Tyler? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So I think everyone is on board with that. I didn't want to leave without addressing the question, just a quick discussion of the question that Deborah brought up about uh, the Social Justice Committee and whether there's a role for HRC in that. Um, and let me just open it up and Deborah, maybe you can give your thoughts first since it's your item. Can I just go back for one second? One quick second. Last year, the retreat was on October 2nd. If we stay to that time frame, it would be October 1st. That's it. Okay, moving on. Okay, Deborah, the floor is yours. 
I love your um, desire to get things done. I just have to say, um, I yeah, I I'm really asking for guidance uh, as to whether or not it it would be an appropriate role for the HRC to speak on behalf of the or speak in allyship or accomplishment um, with the committee about not having a quorum and not uh, nominations not being moved forward and. If we do think that's appropriate, how do we do that? I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know what the protocols or the process would be. Would we write a letter to Paul? I mean, I'm. Well, should we do? Are that? we talking about the CSSJC? Yes, the fact that they really become dysfunctional. I mean, they could not dysfunctional, but that they cannot function without a quorum, and that there is the perception that not enough is being done or not enough is being done fast enough to help them get a quorum. Pamela, you have your hand up. Inform us, please. <laughs> so first, just to, to the first question, um, the two groups worked really hand in hand last year and um, worked very closely, wrote letters of support on, on various issues, um, um, co-sponsored events. So I think it's certainly appropriate for the HRC to take that role and it was the role that um, that that occurred last year. Um, often there were joint letters um, uh, um, that were that were drafted and and reviewed by both by both boards and then um, sent to town council. So that's totally appropriate. Um, at the last CSJC uh, meeting, there was a lot of discussion about the fact that the, they do not have a quorum, and uh, Jennifer. Um, there were there are a number of questions raised about why there hasn't been uh, why there hasn't been interviews, how many applications there were. So I I think these facts are just important to know, and you can do with them what you will. Um, there are, are there were eight applications for the CSJC. Six of them um, um, are also joint applications for the HRC, and there was a discussion about why were um, about why there was a delay or why both um, why those applications were being joined together. And I did share that in my experience over the last year, many people who apply for the HRC also apply for the CSJC and vice versa. And since there are vacancies on both boards, I think the 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 um, the inclination from the town managers was to have one interview session where all of the individuals could be interviewed, and then they would be appointments made to the various boards. Um, I do know uh, that there was an attempt to schedule some interviews for both boards that would have occurred on Monday, but unfortunately I am out of the office on, on Monday. And I simply know that because uh, Angela uh, sent, um, who does the scheduling and who was out for the last two weeks, uh, sent an invite um, for the, uh, for those interviews. And then I'm sure looked at my, calendar and saw that I'm out on Monday. So I know that they are there are some efforts to um you know to get them to to have the interviews and there would be interviews for both the HRC and the CSJC. Oh I, I see that it was oops sorry rescheduled for the 28th. Yeah. So we may have a full house for the next meeting, which is nice, but I'm wondering about these interviews and whether there aren't any substitutes, you know, like, does it have to be these senior people like the town manager and you personally, or can there be someone else get in your place or his place? You know, it seems like you all would have so much to do and there are so many committees. So I I, um, I think it's by bylaw, Jennifer, please weigh in, but I think that the uh, the appointment um, are by bylaw have to be done by the town manager. So I that I think that's why he's a present at each of the uh, uh, of the interviews. And um, I think the role that Jennifer and I have, like I think various staff 
do can be interchanged. So if I wasn't able to make it, I'm sure it would be perfectly fine for Jennifer to be in. It's a staff liaison. I've sat on the interviews for um, for um, HRC and for the Disability Advisory Access Committee. And when that committee start, when I started in the town last year, that committee um, much uh, had three vacancies, and it took pretty much most of the year to get them to the point where they are now fully, you know, they have a full um, commission or a full committee where all of, there are no vacancies on, on that. And there was some turnover, I think um, not to provide excuses for the CSSJC vacancies, but there were, um, there were a large number of vacancies at um, all at the same time. And, um, and at least, one, probably two were not expected, um, so. So maybe I should just ask quickly for uh, raising of hands or an expression of opinion about whether we should send a letter, say, to the town manager, say, expressing concern about, and or something else. What what kind of support should we, should we send support? And then if we say yes, we can figure out what we want to say. So if you think we should somehow, you know, have a put forward an expression of support, could you raise your hand? Can I just say something first? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me today is the 16th and we have interview set for the 28th. Is that right, Jennifer? Yes. So I am looking at one, two, three, four, five of us on the Human Rights Commission where there's supposed to be nine, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes or no, Pamela, Jennifer. Okay, so my assumption, and I do not know how many um, vacancies, that's the good word, vacancies there are on the CSSJC. And my assumption is that there is at least 75% of the folks that you interview may take up some of these vacancies. Yes, no, maybe. So if that is the truth and they have already been, I don't know what that word is, like vetted or if somebody's look over their applications and see that they're qualified, but we have to have some interviews and stuff like that and they're set for the 28th, are we being premature of pushing the envelope, if you will? And if they don't happen on the 28th, will we then make a hard line stance? That's the question. So we have the yeah. question. Should we wait? Go ahead, Debbie. Debra. So yet again, I love your question. And I could go either way. Um, I don't think we have anything to lose by saying something now because the committee was so concerned about the delay. And so standing in solidarity with them, just with like, a, I'm thinking a two sentence thing, you know, the Human Rights Commission stands in solidarity um, with this, I'm trying to get the acronym right, CSJC, um, in calling for rapid decision-making on qualified new members so they could have a quorum. One sentence, right? And I'm totally happy to wait. So what you just said has a different thought in my process, which is understanding that there are, I don't know how to write this. So Ronnie, write it down or Pamela or somebody. Understanding that there are interviews set for August 28th that would then um, satisfy the number of members on the HRC and the CSSJC, we would like to, um, I don't know if it's put on notice or make sure, I don't know how the word, how, how to word this, but we would just like to, to do something, something, something where you all know that we are serious about y'all need to do this post haste by getting qualified 
members on each of these committees. And I don't know exactly how to put that. Yeah, I would say we urge that you expeditiously ensure that qualified members um, are nominated for both, or I don't know if that's the right word, are appointed, are appointed to both committees. To satisfy our-, our... To Satisfy quorum needs, yeah, yeah. Okay. Look at that drafting in the moment. <laughs> So are we agreeing to send one now or we send one now saying? I would say send one now, you know, and lead with understanding so, yeah. that. So let me, let me suggest. Blah, blah, blah. We are urgently um, requesting yeah. that whatever Deborah just said. Yeah. <laughs> you appoint and qualified. Let's, 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 circ let's circulate a draft so everybody's okay with the words and be done with it. Um, who wants to, Pamela, do you want to, do you have it? Or Deborah, do you want to send it out and you and Liz figure it out and then send it out to the rest of us? Pamela, how about you and I wordsmith? Pamela's going on vacation. Perfection. She's not going to be here starting She's tomorrow. going on vacation. Oh, going on vacation. Send me what you have. Send yeah, me what you Debra, have. I'll, I'll get it out yeah. to Ronnie. Okay. okay. So um, right. I yeah. took down a as quickly as I could, what you stated. I will send that to you. Um, I will need to remind you though, that uh, you uh, need to send information to Jennifer and that you're not supposed to be deliberating and voting on things <laughs> outside of your meeting. So you might wanna to make a motion and, and, um, and come to some agreement about your I move that the draft language which has been um, put forth today be approved and it will uh, it may be modified only for copy editing. I don't know Jennifer what do you think girlfriend? I'm not I'm not sure what you're saying here. Are you saying that um, they cannot send it send out a message to the members of the commission for us to concur because that would be voting. <laughs> yes, that's what yes. she said. <laughs> so how about, again, how about, how about if they now. send it out? Wait a minute. How about if Deborah sends it out and we send our comments to Jennifer individually? And then Jen puts it together. Because now we've agreed that we will put a statement out and then the they, and that Deborah will draft the statement and send it to Actually, Jen, we, and we send I comments to, to her. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. We can say this more strongly. We have agreement on what we want to say. I really have to strongly say, as an attorney, that wordsmithing for copy editing purposes, which means grammar and punctuation, and maybe assuring that tense uh, uh, agrees, you know, from one end of the sentence to the other, is not something you need to vote on. So yeah. you guys can't make any, well, I'll let it be at that, but the town particularly does not like it. It seems like you guys already pretty much know what you want to say and they could just give you the flexibility to draft it and you could send it to me. And then that could just be the end because I don't think, and I'm assuming that your commissioner the commissioners have trust that you will stick by your word with what you're writing. And then that's just that, right? And it, it doesn't have to move any I other I can way. go with that. Uh, Tyler, I make a motion that Deborah draft a letter to, uh, I want to say Professor Buckleman, but that's not his title. Okay. <laughs> so it, it, so um, I'm interrupting Guys, just because I, it's- I need to uh, go. It's uh, Deborah who's, who is drafting the letter that's being sent to Jennifer. That is being circulated by Jennifer um, to, with all the to all the committee members. Am I right, Correct. Jen? Yes. Okay. And there won't be another vote. It's just no, I. There's not. no need. There's Go no ahead, need. Ben, there's a typo. Mm -hmm. Now we'll catch the typo, Deborah. So um, the I just I have to say two things quickly. One is that the two co-chairs you do pretty much just were the ones that wrote anything that we were supporting. It was Ben and Philip and the commissioners had basically given them trust for the most part of it. The other thing that I wanted to say is that I, I have to announce that I was the human rights commission chair from Northampton reached out today um, 
with several different kinds of questions, but is in hope that on December 10th, when we celebrate human, the Declaration of Human Rights, which it'll be the 75th anniversary, that we can work with Northampton and East Hampton to have a joyous across the bridge. And so therefore I will email the two co-chairs now that we have them, um, right. the contact information for And can we Diana. put that on our next agenda for our agenda for September or our retreat? Yes. Either one? Both. Okay. Everything. And so does that mean that you would like me or Ronnie to draft the letter? As opposed no, not to this time. No letter. You guys can figure okay. out how you want to do it next time. But okay. But right now I think it's because we just rolled Deborah we, and and that's fine. Okay. okay. One last question. Did y'all's office move yet? Yes. So now you're in the Banks okay. Community Center instead of in, so I, does the commission know that? I'm not sure who you're referring to as the commission. Do we know that? Right. So well, that's what I, I'm I know that, so um, Ronnie is trying to leave. She needs to get out of the meeting, but just as a last word, um, we have moved into temporary office space on the second floor of the Bang Center. Um, if you come um, off the elevator, we are to the left of the Crest Department in temporary spaces. And don't take the stairs because you can't get in through the stairwell. Right. What? You have to have a key okay. code for the stairs. Ah, uh, okay. So, Just so you don't walk up and then have to walk back down. Um, our next meeting date then is September. What is the date? I don't have a calendar. 20th. Our next meeting date is September 20th. Um, and with that, I'm closing, calling this meeting of the Human Rights Commission to a close. So we just need to say the time. Uh, the time is 8.13 p.m. Thanks. I second. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye. Take care, everybody. Stay safe out there. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.